Hi everybody, I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching The Sit Down. One of the most poignant documentaries I've seen all year is by this woman here, Irene Taylor Brosky. How are you? I'm great, thanks so much. Very nice to meet you. Moonlight Sonata, Deafness in Three Movements. It was fantastic. You should be really proud of what you did there. It's, uh, it was a very personal endeavor. Yeah. You know, a documentary memoir is not a uh, very wide, widely, uh, it's not a very wide form, I guess you could say, but it's actually my second one. Mm. I made one 12 years ago also about my mother and father. So um, I'm always sort of trying to refine with every film I do, but this one was, uh, yeah, this was a particular challenge. Definitely, <laughs> so why don't we get into some of those challenges because it's, yeah. it's deeply personal, it's your parents, it's your son in yeah. dealing with all that. And also it's dealing with deafness and we really haven't talked about that a lot in our society. So what was mm -hmm. it like unpacking all those different things? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as far as deafness goes, I think the film looks at three deaf people over three centuries. So it looks at Beethoven as he went deaf, yeah. writing the Moonlight right. Sonata. It looks at my father, who's, we could call him a 20th century deaf man. And then it looks at this 21st century deaf boy, who's my son. And their experiences are phenomenally different. Mm. You know, the technology we have, our attitudes about deafness. And I hope that the film really does explore some of our uh, some of our notions about what deafness is. You yeah. know, is it a mistake or is it an asset? And also just how deaf people live their lives every single day because like your father can drive around, you know, and that's something he was doing his whole life. And then your son gets cochlear implants and that changes his whole life. So mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. kind of breaking down those archetypes of what we kind of think about and no, this is actually reality. So how did you play with that throughout the documentary? Well, that's a challenge where as a filmmaker, I was a little blind to mm. that because for me, having deaf people in my life yeah, on a daily basis is like, is very typical yeah. to me. So that's where like having a good team, a good producer, um, mentors, um, executive producers, people who can come in and look at that and say, hold on to that moment, that's important. Mm. People don't usually get to see that kind of thing. And, and it's interesting for people to see how deaf people sit down and play cards. I'm right. like, it is? Yeah. <laughs> you know, things like that. So it's just, um, it's really a team effort in that regard, but definitely the impetus for the film and sort of the soul of the film comes from my experience having a deaf father and mother mm. and having a deaf son and sort of being in the middle of that and how I interpret what deafness is really. So it's something you live with your whole life, but when do you get the point? When do you get to the point where you can talk about this with other people and also show the whole world what your family has been going through? How does that work for you? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think probably my parents' deafness it informed my work as an artist and as a journalist. Actually, yeah. um, from a young age because it was the 1970s and because there were no smartphones and there, there were TTYs, but it was really hard for a deaf person to land meaningful work and to be treated with dignity and respect by the doctor's office or my school teachers. So I was kind of a stand-in for my parents a mm. lot. And uh, that is something that I think prepared me to be an information seeker, an information gatherer. Um, and someone who likes to tell stories. My parents were very involved in photography. They're very visual. They're very observant. So I think that made me appreciate their deafness pretty early on, like once I started to develop my life as a professional and an artist and a filmmaker. Um, having a deaf son, though, is very different mm. because everything's up to me and right. his dad. You know, it's like a, a, a much bigger responsibility. So, uh, you know, we live in a very very complex time where we are really questioning and rightly questioning what disability means. Is it a disability or is it a different ability? I mean, Beethoven, for all intents and purposes, was a disabled person. Yeah. And yet look at what he created. And we often think of that as like, wow, he created that Fifth Symphony or the Ninth Symphony in spite of his deafness. But I think we really need to be asking ourselves if he created it because of his deafness, mm. that his deafness brought to his music and to his sensibility something that was, that was very different certainly unique to other composers. Yeah, I think that's a great point because even the fact that your dad taught you how to use a camera, like that yeah. was one of the coolest little nuggets in there. And the way that he teaches you, it, it, it's different potentially than another father teaches. So were you keenly aware of that as a young girl or is it something that you kind of realized a little bit older in life that your parents and their experiences with you were just, they're teaching you different things comparatively to everybody else? Mm -hmm. 
You know, I'd be lying if I if I said that it didn't bother me a little bit growing up that my parents were deaf. I think it was a little bit trickier, just even with my social friends and circles and how to get my parents to understand I wanted to go to someone's house after school. I mean, I couldn't call them on the phone, you know? I could never use the phone with my parents until I was in late high school. Mm. So, um, I think though, as I got older, as with many of us, you know, when you get older, you start to see uh, the things that make you who you are. And, you know, that's me as a person, that's me as a filmmaker, that's me maybe as a professional and now as a mother, right? So I, I, uh, I definitely think they've had a great influence on my life. And, and making the memoir about them first was, I think, the right direction. I couldn't have made it something about my son and then gone back and made it on my parents. It would have been impossible to do it on him without having already sort of been through this, this uh, this endeavor hmm. once before. So your son yeah. has a really special relationship with his grandparents, just given the similarities and also some of the differences. So when did you sense that with him? And then through the film, what was it like telling that story and that part of mm -hmm. it? When we found out that Jonas was going deaf and it was looking to be a one-way street and it was, uh, he was losing the majority of his hearing, uh, my parents left New York and moved out to the West Coast to live with us. So at that point, it was really their move that gave the opportunity for them to become close. And I think that they, uh, they've they always sort of relied on each other for perspective. They look at Jonas and they see what's possible moving forward. Um, and Jonas looks at them and just sees them, like you said, he just sees them living their life. Right. And he sees a deaf adult or a deaf senior adult living their life and being confident and being happy and having uh, family and friends. And I think that that sounds so basic, but I think when you're a disabled kid and you don't have role models, it can really be uh, disorienting yeah. because you don't know what's ahead for you. You don't see all of those road signs that you would typically see if you're a more typical kid. So I think it's been really critical. Yeah, and sometimes there are those role models, but to have it directly in your life and having his grandparents there all the time, like that that's a huge thing. It's tangible. You can yeah. actually see it compared to somebody he watches on TV or somebody he looks at on a website. Like that yeah. that must have been really huge for him. It was, and I think when, you know, we had this routine for a few years where my parents would pick the kids up from yeah. school every day. And so there is a poignant scene in the film, you know, where that has to come to an end. We can't allow dad to drive anymore. And I think that Jonas, uh, that hits him too. He realizes that uh, dad may have complications that he wasn't aware of. And so I think that's been part of his adolescence, just sort of digesting what all that means. That so. was the rawest scene of, of the whole thing. I mean, because if you're just having that conversation with him, it's, it's incredibly difficult. Putting a camera there is a whole different story. So mm -hmm. how long did that take? How did you deal with that? Well. That particular conversation probably was only 10 minutes or so, but um, there were a number of times making the film where I just had to grab whatever camera was available. Sometimes that was an iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, usually it was my camera, because my studio is on my property next to the house. But I, uh, I really tried to get the family on board in the beginning where I'd say, look, there's just going to be a camera rolling as often as possible. And so they got very used to it very quickly, you know. And, um, and so in the case of difficult conversations, and there's several of them in the film, conversations that most people don't have the privilege of seeing in yeah. someone else's family, you know. Um, but I, I always asked. If it was a difficult conversation, or it was going to be a difficult conversation, I always asked. And sometimes I pushed a little. But the reason I pushed is because I really knew that ultimately I would be in control of the narrative. And I knew that I would never do anything that would be harmful to them, or shameful, or embarrassing. Right. Um, that's not to say that I wasn't willing to include things that made me look bad, or someone else look flawed, mm -hmm. you know. I think that's really important, that kind of brutal honesty when you're a filmmaker, particularly in documentaries. I think our audiences have become very sophisticated. You're very smart, and I think you always have to be making your film with the idea that someone smarter than 
you are. Like right. I think that my audience will be smarter than me. And so I, I really want to uh, tell the truth, really. Hmm. <laughs> what were the other tough conversations when you look back on it now? Um, so probably the toughest moments in the film, uh, I also, my, my father came over one night to tell me that there was just something wrong hmm. with his mind and he couldn't put his finger on it. That was a tough conversation to film. When Jonas uh, was younger and getting cochlear implant surgeries, he had them twice. Um, I had to uh, decide whether or not I wanted to film any of that. And I didn't film the surgeries, um, but I did film the moments after his surgery and before his surgery, and that was really hard because I was trying to be totally present. But, you know, I've done this for a long time now, and sometimes having a camera, because I'm a photographer as well, having a camera is like an extension of myself. Mm. So for me to document it and look at something through a lens instead of looking at someone person to person, it doesn't diminish or take away from it. In fact, it almost uh, reassures me that I'm holding on to this moment. Mm. And uh, I think in the case of documenting my family, I always told myself, I don't know where this story's headed because every documentary has a surprise ending, especially for the filmmaker, yeah. right? Yeah. But I'll always have this material and I'll always have this as a document. So, you know, it was sort of a win-win in no that question. case. And yeah. so um, I think bringing it to the world sometimes can be daunting because I forget that once you've seen the film, you've seen the inside of my home, you see the way we... Everything. We see yeah. every, you see everything. And, and I forget how revealing that is, mm. you know, uh, because I live it, right. so, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're <laughs> constantly putting a mirror up to your own life yeah. and, and the lives of others, so it just felt like another day in the life. Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. So when I'm watching this, it kind of felt boyhood-esque in a sense that like we get to see your son grow over the years. Yeah, so what yeah. was the most fascinating part to you as you saw your son grow up to be a young man? Yeah, well, I certainly was uh, inspired by great stories of coming of age or of boyhood. There's also one of my favorite documentaries in the world uh, made several years ago by a Scandinavian director called Brothers. Mm. And it was about two boys growing up together and it followed them over the course from birth up through college. Wow. And it was such a phenomenal piece of work by a mother about her son, about her two sons. So, you know, I really, uh, I think that I'm not trying to say that my son's a piano prodigy. I am not trying to say that my family is any more special, but I'm just trying to reveal our truth. And our truth really is about this so-called disability we call deafness. And while the implants have done phenomenal things for Jonas's life experience, and his ability to understand how music works. I think that ultimately his deafness is bringing a strength and a, and a power and like our, his grandfather showed him, it can bring with it a certain dignity, you know? And, um, and I think we should be talking about these yeah. things. You know, I think there's been a lot of interesting and sometimes combative dialogue around the experience of deafness because implants go inside the body hmm. and in a way, you could say that deaf people today wearing cochlear implants are, are sort of the vanguard of a new human, where we actually can restore a sense by putting technology inside our yeah. bodies. And what does that make us? What is then our identity? That becomes a little messy. But these are really important conversations. We should be having them. And I think what many people in my deaf universe mm -hmm. have uh, come to understand is that implantation doesn't necessarily need to diminish deaf identity and the culture around the deaf experience. Um, it's this added tool. And as with any tool, you know, you can use it how you want. You can right. turn it off, yeah. you can turn it on. Right. You know, we call it in our family our superpower. Mm. And it's not because you can hear, it's because you can choose not to hear as oh, well. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I like the way you guys frame that. Yeah. It feels like identity is a huge part of this when you think about it, just how we shape identity and also how we talk about different things too. Absolutely, and I'm not deaf. And right. so I've always grown up in this family where I wasn't quite deaf, but I was in this culture, and now I have a deaf son, and I'm not sure what's ahead for him, mm. culturally speaking, but it certainly has made me more thoughtful as a, as a filmmaker about identity and about 
you know, these things we call disabilities and what they actually are doing for us. I mean, I really, I, I, I am in awe at what Beethoven created for all of humanity. Uh, unbelievable. That he, le that he left for yeah. us. And the majority of the canon we know of his work was created when he was going deaf or profoundly deaf. I mean, really think about that. It's, it blows your mind. It, it, it and, really and does. And it's not like this is a heroic story of, oh, we're, we're praising this disabled man for what he could do in spite of this, this wrenching disability. I think there were certainly moments, many moments, I'm sure, of tremendous isolation that he felt. But think about what isolation also can do. Hmm. It can allow you to really tune into yourself and if you're confident about yourself, but even more so, if what in is inside of you, you find beautiful, you can just listen to that and you can shut out all the noise. And I think anyone who is watching this movie and who lives in the 21st century, we all want to shut out the noise a lot because mm, there's yeah. a lot of it, right. you know? And so uh, I think that Beethoven and Jonas and Paul in this film, our characters really give us a bit of a lesson on how to do that. And I think you're the perfect person to tell the story because of your parents, of having one son who has this, and also having kids that don't have this too. So you've constantly thought about identity and just communication and sound, and mm -hmm. you clearly have done the work, and it shows with your documentary. So I, it feels like there shouldn't be any other person to tell this story. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Definitely. So when people do check this out, whether it's in theaters, a couple months from now, what are the big thoughts for them to take away? You know, let's get talking about disability and what really that means anymore. I think particularly with a, a deaf child or a deaf adult that has this technology that gives them the ability to hear, it's a different kind of hearing, it's a different kind of experience. But let's talk about that and let's talk about what that brings, not just to the person, but to all of us. Um, I think also we should be thinking about um, aging. Hmm. You know, th th this is also, a coming of age story about a man coming to grips with his own age and his mortality and the limits of the human body. And the interesting thing is I don't think the deafness was limiting him. It was the dementia. Right. You know? And so I, I, I really realized since we launched this film at Sundance in the last eight months, if there's one thing I've learned is that anyone who has a family can relate to this movie. Oh yeah. You know, no and question. and it may not be a deaf family or a family with some of the weird, strange unusual idiosyncrasies we have. But I think, you know, thinking about our own families, I think this is really a strong theme. A last thing I think this film really brings up is for us to really examine what we call mistakes and what's the mm. value of a mistake. You know, this is about a boy learning how to play a piece and he's 11 years old and it's a reach for him. Right. So he makes a lot of mistakes and he doesn't like hearing mistakes. But the thing is the mistakes can actually become the music we play in that it's our approach and it's our particular take on something. And you know, deafness by many people in the medical community, that would be considered a, a mistake of mm. the human body or a mutation. Um, and we're moving more into the direction of, well, maybe it's a variation. Yeah, maybe I, I a like variation yeah. a lot better. Yeah. And like you said, you can stumble into a way that you didn't expect to go. Yeah. You know, I, I can only imagine what Beethoven was thinking as he was dealing with that and writing this music. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's been an absolute pleasure. Right. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Check this film out. You won't be disappointed. That's Irene. I'm DJ. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.